Hi everybody, this is Dr. A. I'm bringing you a couple videos on point of care testing. We're going to do an introduction to point of care testing in this video. So point of care testing refers to analytical patient testing activities that are done within a medical institution but outside of the main clinical lab or the core lab. So it is usually under the oversight of the lab but the actual testing is done by um, non-lab personnel such as nurses. So some of the advantages of point of care testing are going to be the convenience for the uh, physician and the patient. Um, a lot of times it's just the convenience of being able to see results almost right away. Um, they're um, having them right there and then of course then uh, for the patient it's often just a finger stick or something minor and that means a shorter visit, um, faster decision making on treatment and diagnosis, etc. So um, that's a reduced turnaround time, right? So from, from sample to results, short, shorter amount of time. And uh, so this is especially helpful in situations like in the operating room, in the emergency room, in the intensive care unit, and in clinics where patients are just coming in for checkups and visits, especially if you're managing chronic conditions like diabetes. Um, this also can reduce clinic visits hospital admissions and length of stay. Uh, you also get better patient management because you don't have to wait for results maybe that are sent to another, to a lab or core lab. Let's say if you're a clinic and you send your samples to a core lab, then you have to wait for the results to come back, then you have to contact the patient. And you know sometimes things doesn't, they don't follow through and you know, stuff can fall through the cracks and you know follow up doesn't happen. And so um, there's also a decreased manpower need. Um, that is associated with the testing. So uh, this is uh, especially true for tests that are needed several times a day. So uh, a point of care test is done by one person. So um, and oftentimes it can be a phlebotomist or somebody that's at the bedside like the nurse. And so you don't need um, another, like, well, a phlebotomist to come draw a specimen and then transport it, or even if you have people that are transporting or transport systems, and then a tech that receives it, or even somebody that receives it in central processing, and then somebody that receives it at the department to test it, etc. So, um, you know, you need one person versus several uh, for regular testing. Uh, finger sticks are less traumatic, and they require less sample volume. So that's uh, two advantages. Although I know some people would rather get a venipuncture to a finger stick because it does hurt to prick the fingers because they're quite sensitive. But generally speaking, people uh, you know, are less afraid of you poking their finger than of you coming at them with a needle. Uh, there are less pre-analytical errors uh, because you do eliminate many steps. Uh, there's no transport, there's no aliquoting, no splitting off, you don't, you know, there's no checking the specimen in or anything like that. And there are also less post-analytical errors because um, there is no need to communicate the results from the lab to the nurse because the nurse is performing the testing, so they know the results right away. Um, and so it's just, it's, you know, it, again, prevents certain errors. Um, there is also improved patient outcomes in overall patient care, having the results, you know, available right away. Um, and there is a wide menu of point-of-care test uh, analytes with no processing, so that means uh, there's no need to spin the tube down and pull serum or plasma off or anything like that. And the um, equipment is easy to operate. And uh, this can also increase the availability um, to areas that have limited infrastructure or personnel. So think of rural and underserved areas. They can then ha have access to testing just through point of care uh, because they don't have to try to man and staff a, a core lab. Some of the disadvantages, because we do have to talk about those also. So it is significantly more expensive than the central lab testing. Uh, there is higher disposable reagent and uh, the point of care testing analyzer costs, those have to be factored in. Um, and so when you decide whether it's worth it or not, and we're going to talk about that soon, um, you know, you, you do also have to factor in the cost of, in regular testing, there might be uh, cheaper per test in reagents and costs and stuff, but you also have to factor the cost of the phlebotomy supplies, of your phlebotomist, of the techs, and you know all their salaries and all of that. So, you know, you have to take it all into consideration. Another disadvantage is uh, the maintenance of the quality control and quality assurance rec records is difficult, 
And this is mostly because there are so many people running the test and um, some testing platforms do not have QC lockout. And so, uh, you know, you could discover a week, um, you know, later, let's say, that um, on one of the nursing floors, nobody's on QC and nobody's been locked out or something like that. So um, there is also inter-individual variability, um, which is greater with point of care testing than with the core lab testing. Uh, so that has to do with, uh, you know, variability of the test results um, between the individuals, um, you know, performing the test. And um, also even there's variability between the different uh, um, anal little analyzer. So like if you took three different brands of AccuCheck machines for the glucose testing and poked somebody's fingers and ran it on all three, it was very possible to get three different results. Um, how wide the difference is, that's been a topic of study. So there can be difficulties with documentation of test results and with billing and compliance. So um, this is especially true if it's something that can't be interfaced into an electronic health record or a laboratory information system so that if it's just a little kit that you can grab and just run real quick, um, you know, what if you forget to bill for it or what if the results are never reported? Um, and so that, that can be an issue. Um, so. Um, yeah, the integration into the patient's electronic health record can be difficult if the device doesn't automatically interface. Um, then you also have to manage the reagents, it reagent supply and the storage at multiple sites. So, um, you know, let's just take a hospital with the, the glucose testing because that's the most widely used one. Well, there has to be enough reagents, uh, strips and stuff on all the nursing floors that are using it from the ER to the ICU. Um, even in the OR, but in, in all the nursing floors. And um, so, you know, that's a lot to keep up with. Um, and then the core lab test results and the point of care testing results are not always comparable. And so that can cause confusion, uh, especially when um, both of them are going on. So let's talk a little bit about the regulation of point of care testing. So um, all testing, including point of care testing, falls within the scope of the CLIA regulation. So the FDA, and uh, which is the Federal Drug Administration, and then CMS, which is the Center for, Medi Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, will oversee and enforce CLIA 88, which is a legislation. And uh, as part of that legislation in um, the re CLIA regulation, um, they um, have categorized different tests uh, by complexity. So your testing complexity categories are this. What we have first is waived testing. So um, a lot of your point of care testing, I would say most of your point of care testing is going to fall under this category. So these are simple tests and there's a little chance of negative outcome if it was done, done wrong. So it's just basically really hard to screw that test up. Okay, so that is why it's wave testing, and this is often, um, you know, the type of test that um, we let non-lab folks do because it, it's just so easy to do. And then you have the moderately complex testing. So this is 75% of more than 12,000 test methods that are routinely done in the lab. They usually requires automation, um, and these are things like your blood counts and your chemistry tests that are run on big analyzers. Then you have uh, high complexity testing, and they require much more um, complex oper uh, operator skills and decision making. So there's a lot of thinking and making the right decisions on and how to proceed and how to work through problems. Um, uh, some are non-automated, um, or uh, some of them have instrumentation, but the instrumentation itself is complicated. So an example of a high complexity testing is going to be cross matches, um, but also maybe um, high performance of chromatography, because some of those HPLCs can be a little cantankerous. Um, and then you have provider performed microscopy. So this testing does have special requirements, but it is, for example, the slide examination on a microscope of freshly collected body fluids by a physician or a lab tech. So um, diagnostic testing uh, that is not performed within a traditional lab is called wave testing by the Joint Commission. So all sites that perform lab testing 
are regulated under the CLIA Lab Improvement of 1988 and must be licensed to perform any type of testing. So if it's a clinic, if it's a hospital, if it's uh, even, you know, um, a, a, a little uh, teaching lab or something like that, if you're going to do any kind of testing on patient samples, you have to have a license, a CLIA license. And it, in the license, it can specify which level of testing you can do. It can wave, moderate complexity, high complexity. And so um, if you just have a wave testing license, that's the only type of testing that you can do. So, um, and this, you know, they will come and inspect the CLIA license has always has to match the level of testing complexity that's being done by that lab. So CLIA has also granted what we call dean status to different uh, approved accreditation organizations. And so those entities can come and accredit and license testing sites. Um, and so you, you know, just something you would have to purchase and have to maintain. And um, state and city governments can enact mandatory regulations that would be state or city specific, uh, including the qualification of personnel performing the test. So uh, this could be more stringent, but never less stringent than federal regulations. So the CLIA regulation is the minimum standard. So uh, if the test, um, if I'm sorry, if the state looks at a test and decides, or a, a type of testing decides they want to up the requirement, the education level, or whatever of you know the the performer, of the person performing the test, then um, they can do that at the state level and enact that. So they could say, for example, that uh, only lab techs with a bachelor's level, um, you know, degree training can do high complexity testing or something like that. So um, the importance of decentralized laboratory point of care assays. Um, so this is a kind of a more of a global perspective. The World Health Organization identified about 147 essential laboratory tests, to call them EDL, so essential diagnostic labs probably. Um, and from this inventory, 19 lab tests with the highest number of applications to essential medicine have been ranked. Uh, and so these should be reasonably available for people all over the world who need them um, in the form of point of care testing or central lab, centralized lab testing. And so I've highlighted the ones that are readily available and point of care testing, but these are the 19 that they deemed like everybody should have access to all over the world. So the complete blood count. Uh, some, of, some of them can be point of care tests on a complete blood count. It just kind of depends on the instrumentation. Uh, liver enzymes, renal function, microscopy, urinalysis, nucleic acid testing, and microbiology. So this is going to be some of your PCR testing uh, like we've been doing for COVID. Uh, electrolytes, uh, microbiology, culture and sensitivity, glucose, um, the antigen testing in microbiology, serology, um, human chorionic gonadotropin, which is HCG, which is the pregnancy test, uh, bacterial biochemical typing, lipid panels, the CD4 lymphocyte count, this is applicable for HIV patients, blood gases, coagulation testing, hemoglobin A1C, and calcium. So all the ones I highlighted are pretty common point of care tests. Not saying that some of the others don't have some application in point of care testing, but yeah, we're going to keep going and talk about this. So um, patient-centric lab testing. Um, so this is um, really interesting. So in two, 2016, the Food and Drug Administration published a new final guidelines. And so it was called blood glucose monitoring testing system, sorry, for prescription point of care use and self-monitoring blood glucose test, test systems for over-the-counter use. So now they're differentiating between what we do in clinics and hospitals and what can be done at home by patients. So, um, so this is the first time that performance guidelines clearly differentiated the requirements for both types of CLIA wave devices. So self-monitoring of blood glucose devices versus blood glucose monitoring in, um, you know, a professional setting such as a clinic or a hospital. And um, so um, this, you know, part of this has to do with um, the, you know, quality, quality control and interface. And there's so many aspects that, you know, they've, 
you know, decided to differentiate between the two. Um, so let's talk a little bit about non-instrument based point of care tests. So uh, manual rapid test methods include those, for example, for pregnancy, fecal occult blood, infectious mono. Most non-instrument based tests apply the principles of competitive and non-competitive immunoassays, em enzymatic assays, or chemical reactions with a visually red endpoint color change, something that's easy to see. The point of care assay usually um, will assay whole blood, although urine, feces, saliva, and throat swabs can also be tested. They're often in kits with reagents with instructions that are really easy to follow. So then we have handheld point of care equipment. So um, the microprocessors in small and often handheld instruments will provide automated, easy to perform testing with calibration and onboard QC. So the uh, most important characteristics of a point of care test device are uh, they require a small blood sample and there's a rapid turnaround time. They're easily portable and they have single use disposable reagent cartridges or test strips and they're easy to perform protocols that usually have one or two steps. It's often, you know, load the sample into cartridge, put the cartridge in the machine, press start. That's usually the level of complexity right there. So um, the accuracy and precision of the, re the results are comparable with the central lab analyzers. There's minimal QC tracking that is needed. Um, and often these uh, reagents can be stored at ambient temperature, which means room temperature. So um, it's good for them to have a barcode technology for the test packs, controls, and the specimens. So they can tr you can track patients through. And then some of these smaller devices can also interface to lab information systems and electronic health records. Um, it should have there should be economical equipment costs and maintenance free. So it should be you know, pretty easy to deal with and buy. And there should be some software for automatic calibration. There should be some system lockouts, for example, when QC has not been done for that day. And there should be data management ca uh, capacities. So um, where you can have a hard copy put out, so that's a, a printout of some sort that can be kept, or an electronic data output that interfaces with an LIS or other tracking software. The disadvantage is still the same as we've talked about. There's just It's just a higher cost per test. Um, and then another disadvantage is that errors from improper cleaning of the devices between patients can produce higher error rates for point of care testing than the central lab and could result in disease transmission to patients from the instruments. So you have to be careful. And um, so what are the types of point of care test analyzers, devices, devices and kits? So there's three big categories. So you have the qualitative or some quantitative cartridges or strip tests. So qualitative gives you positive negative results. Um, some quantitative would give you things like negative one plus, two plus, three plus. So, you know, kind of like chunks, categories of, or, um, of results. So the strep test is qualitative, it's positive and negative. Flu test, same thing. A UA, UA dipstick has some semi-quantitative on there. So you have some one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus type of results on those. And then pregnancy test um, and urine drug screens, those are also qualitative, positive and negative. Then you have single use quantitative cartridge or strip test with a reader device. So if it's quantitative, it gives you a number Okay, a specific quantity, specific number. So uh, the glucose is the highest volume point of care test uh, there. So it actually gives you, um, you know, the glucose value, but also uh, there are a lot of blood chemistries that can be done that way, coagulation tests, cardiac markers, C-reactive protein, allergy testing, fertility testing, hemoglobin A1Cs, ABGs, electrolytes, metabolites. And so these are often like handheld devices uh, that can, are portable that can go straight to the patient or straight to the OR. Um, and then you have multiple use quantitative cartridges or benchtop devices. So usually there are like mini analyzers, they're small. Um, they would usually be um, at a specific station or area, maybe in the ER, OR, ICU, or a certain location on, uh, in a certain room on, on the hospital floor. And so um, you can, in those, you can test for hemoglobin species, especially with an ABG. So we're talking about carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, self-hemoglobin, et cetera. 
Um, we can test with bilirubin, we can do ABGs, um, we can do electrolytes, um, other metabolites, we can do cardiac markers, drugs, C-reactive protein, CBC. Again, so these, the analyzers are small, small footprint, benchtop, they're not portable, though you're not, you don't carry those analyzers around to the patient. So, for example, so some of these are, are portable. So here's an example of an iStat. You can do ABGs and also have electrolytes and other things, depending on which cartridge you use on the iStat. This is the ACT machine, so it's a type of portable coagulation testing. This is a small benchtop analyzer called a triage. It's often easy to put at a desk or something. Uh, this can do cardiac markers, um, and brain time maturated peptides and stuff. And then these are like small benchtop analyzers. So we have the uh, Piccolo uh, by Abbott. And so you have a small test cartridge. You can load whole blood. You open it, load it in there. And the, the test cartridge is whatever panel you want to run. It could be a lipid panel, it could be a BMP, it could be just renal um, stuff. So um, those are really easy to perform. And then this is an example of a point of care ABG analyzer. So small footprint, um, easy to put in different locations. Uh, and it just, that's where it stays, but it's usually very convenient for whoever's drawing ABGs, usually respiratory, to, to go from the patient to the analyzer to get the results really quickly. And so some of the methodology used in point of care testing are reflectance. So this is where light is reflected on a surface and it's usually detecting a color change of some sort. Electrochemistry. So this is often in your ABG analyzers. So it uses electrodes to detect gases and uh, electrolytes and things like that. Immunoturbidity. So antigen antibody reactions that causes turbidity. Lateral flow or flow through solid phase immunoassays. Um, those are lateral flow, flow through type stuff are, for example, your pregnancy test. Um, spectral photometry uses light to detect color changes. Fluorescence detects fluorescence. And then polymerase chain reaction. Um, a lot of your um, small little analyzers that did COVID testing, um, um, they are PCR based. And that's it. I'm going to follow you to uh, the next video, and we're going to talk about quality, and so I'll see you there.